that we have vying for political office this time around. And that's one of the reasons why it's a historic election cycle. Unprecedented that we have so many candidates. I mean, even Board of Education, <laughs> Board of uh, Election uh, has contested primaries. And so it really is a time for us as voters, as constituents, to take advantage of the many new faces the many new ideas to make substantive changes. And this is why I am trying to nudge you, talk on your elbow a little bit and say, hey, if you're not at work, particularly if you're at home, Turn off your TV. Because I do believe you would want to pay attention to Attorney Genevieve Whitaker. She's a candidate for the 33rd legislature. And as I hope you know, she is on leave as the deputy supervisor of elections. So she is a number two person to supervise of elections, Carolyn Fox. But beloved, I'm in no position to tell you who to vote for, much less how to vote. <laughs> Carla yesterday uh, was insisting me don't make no sense to vote for more than two people. I don't want to vote for more than three people. You know what I mean? Whether it's superstition, or it's political science that I am not aware of. People have all kind of ways how to go about choosing their representative. Well, I am humbly suggesting that you use your faculties. Use the good sense that your God gave you to pay attention and listen carefully because as a Virgin Islander, as a fellow Christian, beloved, whether you're born here or there, you live here and you're suffering as a Virgin Islander and you're suffering here at a Puja. So you could be casuistic if you want and split them heads. But I say we need help. And I do believe you will agree with that. And for that reason, beloved, I say you need to pay attention. She doesn't have a whole lot of time. She ain't got a lot of resources like them and those who come here by an hour and a half, two hours, that kind of thing. But she got substance. And so, beloved, I urge you to pay careful attention as I am going to return with a perfect candidate for the 33rd legislature. Just hold straight and you pay attention. Give me a quick favor here. Put on your ear. Beloved, it is my privilege to 
to introduce you to a very substantive candidate for the 33rd legislature. She is attorney Genevieve Whitaker on leave as the deputy supervisor of election for the Virgin Islands election system. Attorney Whitaker, I am privileged. Thank you for being here. Welcome. Good afternoon to you. A blessed good afternoon to you, Mario. A blessed good afternoon to all of the listeners. It's always a pleasure to be here. I oftentimes feel like I'm at home in that, in welcome, in that welcome, and I want to thank you so much. And I also want to th thank the callers who've called in in support of uh, my candidacy and overall. Uh, and I want to first begin by first uh, expressing uh, my gratitude and my appreciation, uh, giving thanks to the Creator for where I am um, um, right now and on this journey. I'm also joined by Troy Johannes, uh, my campaign manager, uh, who's also joined me on this journey. And I also, also thank the members of our uh, campaign committee and everyone who's been part of this journey. Brother Mario and to the listeners, uh, when asked the question as to why, why, why should you vote for me? Why should, uh, why have I decided to run as well? My, the question I asked myself and the question I've been asked by the public. The journey for me to be where I am today really began, and I always say, I'm not going to um, go into the exact timeline details, but the, the whole point is that I grew up as raised by my single grandmother. I'm born and raised here on the island of St. Croix, born into a great family community of godparents and, and others who helped to rear me. When we talk about the concept of a village, I truly have been part of a village, and that's honed me to um, where I am today. I've also, from a very young age, was encouraged and in, in the importance of the democracy of service, so very young, all the ages of 11 and 12, I was already a tutor, a mentor to the younger children, me and Benjamin mentored myself. I went to, just a, a way of background, uh, and you can also get more information by going to my website, also my Facebook page, so it's GenevieveWhitaker.com, I'll, I'll, I'll speak slowly, give you my exact website address, it's G-E-N-E-V-I-E-V-E-W-H-I-T-A-K-E-R.com. And in summation of my background and my bio, um, by way of background, I'm trained in the law, um, but my first degree was in government and world affairs. I specifically studied politics. Uh, one of the things I focused on as a, as a student was on matters of uh, the, the U.S.'s relationship with the Virgin Islands, and particularly concept, concepts of colonialism. Went on to law school where I focused on human rights law. And during law school, I focused on immigration and poverty law, and I was and I was also an activist um, during those years. I was an activist with Amnesty International, United Nations Association, so I also honed in my advocacy skills. Also during that time, I took part in all the leadership training, led my own leadership training, came back home, as I've said, committed to give back. Came back home just a few days after law school, and came back home on a mission to make a difference and make a change in my community. In terms of my professional background, in terms of the jobs I've held, I've held uh, in both in the private and public sector. I am um, lead from the Center as a Deputy Supervisor. I've also taught for over eight years, close to nine, at the University of Virgin Islands, teaching crime prevention, and I also teach a course in business law. I've also taught course in leadership. I served as uh, communication, di uh, communication Director, essentially Associate State Director of Communications for AARP Virgin Islands. I've also held a position as a law clerk, I've also worked in as an associate for a law firm, working in the law office then of Abram and Kevin. Um, in between that time, I also formed my own company, really focused on my passion for the nonprofit community because I've also served in a nonprofit. Please remember me, I was part of the reparations movement, serving as a legal counsel, forming my own nonprofit along with young people, young Virgin Islands, many of whom have come home in focusing on the issues of civics and civic engagement. Now, this is now, to, to fast forward now, in running for office, what do I bring to the table? One of my first jobs in coming back home, as I, the first job before I held those other positions was actually serving as a legal counsel, drafting legislation and research, because my background in research is quite vast. It was one of the things I started, because at, at age 15, I had already started in the legal career. I was already, in, throughout law school and, and, and in undergrad, I also worked in law firms. 
And what now I bring to the table is my understanding of government, such that I was able to build a platform that I see as a living document. There are six areas of my platform, each one of them speaking to a revitalization, a reform uh, effort in very important areas. I speak to economic revitalization. When I uh, speak to educational revitalization reform, healthcare, infrastructure reform included within that. I speak to crime prevention and correctional efforts and which to resolve some of our crime issues. I speak to sustainable development in the context of protecting our environment. And also within that, as we speak in connected to economic development is a matter of our government employees retirement system, which I'm happy to say that there's been a great connection with myself and the person of the older generation because I've also been part of those meetings and, and also very attuned to the issue of GIS. Let me break down uh, for this purpose, especially of this uh, time that I have here. When I speak about economic development, my actual legislative plans, because part of most of my job will be about crafting legislation, which I'm committed to doing, having already done, is that one, there's, there's two main items. One is on what's called known as taxes and bonding. And for, the, for those who are listening, just this week, I met with the director of the Economic Development Authority. He's the new director, Kamal Lehan. So, I want, so when I also speak on issues, it's that I've done my homework, I've met with the requisite heads, because even when we talk about GRS, I've met with that director next. I've gone to um, the GRS board meeting. So specifically talking about this tax and bonding, what I would like to bring, because the territories can offer and has offered, even the P Public Finance Authority offering that, is I would like to offer it as a program in which we can address the issues that the contractors face getting bonded, getting insurance to do the work because of their, uh, we look now to the issues of how can we hold on to these federal dollars and circulate the money and benefit our local contractors and anyone who wants to do business here. Also within that, tied into that is our farmers. My commitment uh, in farmers and farmers in, and in assisting them and getting that, the resources they need to farm on a much greater scale. We're also in the process of building up our foundation. So when I speak about contracting through taxes and bonding, I'm speaking specifically about rebuilding our schools, our hospitals, our agencies, critical areas in order to move us forward. They have to be rebuilt. They should have, many should have been rebuilt well before these storms because a lot of our buildings built with federal dollars, many, most of our schools had exceeded the time frame in, in, so in other words, they, before Maria, they should have been rebuilt, and that, that goes on to even talk about Charles Harwood and our hospitals. The other aspect of economic development is my passion for ecotourism, also known as ge geotourism. When I speak of, about that and breaking that down, I'm talking about capitalizing in our history. It is a $100 billion global industry that we can tap into that we have in small ways. In my work in pushing on ecotourism, it would bring together the Economic Development Authority, the Department of Tourism, the Department of Agriculture, the, the, and also, of course, education, even speaking about even the board as well, the board of education as well. And with that, we begin the process really of, and just to highlight, much work has been done specifically by the organization known as Succeed, headed by Agile Hines and that and, and other stakeholders throughout this community in which the work has been done in terms of the study. We capitalize in our history, we work with our farmers, we work with historians, we work with um, persons and getting our young people even engaged in that process to increase the number of people who stay overnight and come here just for, um, for, for, for that specifically. When I speak to economic revitalization and economic reform, it is as an educator I speak to this issue and the passion that I have for curriculum. Because it's, it's, I've been, the issue of curriculum has been on some, since I've come home, fighting for civics and things and in the course of study, is that I will be committed to passing legislation to address in, in many ways some accountability issues and, and using the power of a legislator as a oversight and investigation. Right now, we are concerned about the opening of schools the integrity of those schools, and there's a definite concern for the curriculum. So what I would like to bring, and some of what I have expressed in the ad you're hearing on this station and others, are the course of study, most of which are already law. 
So we're talking about implementation of Virgin Islands and Caribbean history. We're talking about then the agriculture. I would like to amend it to include music, the equine industry, hospitality. It's included in there, hospitality in particular. Economics and finance. Civics is there, but it's only in a 12th grade course. And, and beloved audience, Mario was one of the presenters two years ago on the civics conference that the Board of Education held. I was one of the speakers, a keynote speaker, in which Mario and others, and, and he brought, and particularly Mario brought out the entire K to 12 curriculum of how you would set up civics in our schools. Not to mention the fact of the vast history and information that Mario has provided in his own work and research. And other scholars in this Virgin Islands and got those gone before so we know it's possible. And I harp on that because BI and Caribbean history is about development of our social senses and us as a people to move forward. So when we talk about curriculum, but let me even backtrack because the foundation of curriculum is what? Literacy. And we've had advocates right here and, and, and teachers and others who've advocated for the importance. So I would like to sponsor legislation, and I will sponsor legislation to address our literacy crisis. <laughs> Reading and math also, even in the sciences, but particularly as we've known the statistics of the issues of many of our children not performing at grade level. They reach even the 11th grade and many are underperforming in math and reading. That would require and involve, num number one, of course, attracting more people to the teaching field, but tr attracting more individuals to, to become counselors and our, and our current counselors helping to many who were already on that path, but also helping to even retrain some who are willing as part <laughs> of a process of intervention. They're known as literacy intervention specialists. And I also even go outside of the community to have that assistance and look at establishing even a training college, much more robust training rather, that's offered at the university in, w in which we now have, you'll have your counselors, your teachers, all involved in assessment. And we're doing so especially focused on those younger grades. Also, we can't do anything without our health. And when I say healthcare, I also add healthcare infrastructure, because we're talking about the very buildings and facilities we need. Our own hospitals happen to be rebuilt. But it's also a structural issue with the, within that. And I, while I've not mentioned on the ad, I will go, I'll, I'll highlight to you, the audience, and to many of those concerned with a lot of the stuff that's going on. We're talking about issues and crises with administration. And that will also require legislation of how we examine the hospital board or boards, as there's now this consideration of merging them. A bill has been offered for that. And I also speak about the importance of sponsoring legislation to help and to locate and identify the funding for our healthcare education, which is critical, so we can help the Department of Health and whether resource-wise and of course the funding necessary to expand on the healthcare education program along with our community, because not just we're depending on government, we are an entire community of, we think about the nonprofits and even for-profits working together in tandem to address the issues. And I want to definitely commend all those who are involved when we talk about healthcare and uh, certainly education, because we have a shortfall, of course, with our when we talk about education with after school care. All of that tied in, all of that connected together. I will also add in talking about healthcare is also, of course, the air we breathe. That tie that tying into sustainable development and to understand that we must be committed and legis legislation has to be passed, although very clear that there are we have the Waste Management Authority, of course. We have the Department of Planet and Natural Resources. There must be a, uh, and we have a mandate that several years now of the requirement for recycling. And I do commend those in the communities who are engaging in recycling efforts. And so I will, um, you know, kind of stop there. And I wanted to, um, you know, Mara, do you have any uh, questions for me? And also. We're going to open up the lines in a few, but I also before and right before doing that, I would like um, you all to hear from my campaign manager. We're going to be talking about our canvassing efforts. I I would respectfully like to decline because yes. I know your time is short this first time around. Yes. I would like to be a listener. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, beloved audience. My name is Troy Johannes, and we are trying to locate. We're trying to 
put together some canvassers for our movement. Uh, we're trying to get in touch with all of the different communities. It's a, it's a very big effort and we need your support. One of the, one of the things that Genevieve Whitaker is focused on is always getting community involvement in each and everything she does. And also by do, doing our canvassing measures, we also got a lot of input from the community as to different problems that can be faced um, further down the line. So what I'm doing, I'm trying to ask for um, you to subscribe to her Facebook page, Genevieve Whitaker. Like also, also her website, www.genevieve.com. And you can also um, subscribe on her Facebook page. Yeah, so you can like the Facebook page and subscribe to genevievewhitaker.com. And so then we talk to Troy Johannes and myself, and we also have a supporters group page. You can also um, definitely send an, an email to gotv at genevievewhitaker.com. So thank you for that, Troy. So yes, a part of the, the effort in my candidacy is knocking on doors and canvassing, but also getting the information from the community. And I want to highlight right before we go to the phone lines is that the, the, the effort that needs to be put forward. And I want to get frank and I want to kind of get down to the weeds because not only am I offering legislation, but we have some hard decisions to make. And that will, and it's about the political willpower. To the audience, uh, to my fellow residents of St. Croix, as I humbly ask for your support in electing me to the 33rd legislature, I ask you to be part of the fight that will be necessary to transform this government. The fight that we'll have to fight. We are at a critical place right now. We, are, we are, have crisis in every most important areas, every, every, every area of our society in terms of the important aspects. We're talking about our health care, education, our economics, sustainability right now. And it's gonna require all of us, so I ask that when, and humbly, asking for you and you know, you decide to, to put me in there I will fight for you I'm fighting all now because inside or outside the legislature I'm committed to fighting for what's right I've lived my entire life going against the grain I can speak to my professional experiences I could even speak to my educational experience I was a fighter I've always fought for my own rights and for the rights of others and that I'm committed to do. And that's a promise that I will make to you, the people of the Virgin Islands. But we have to do it together because at the same time as they push and pull, I'll ask you to do the same with me. There will be times when we're gonna have to rally and I would like to, and to add to that, and right before the show began, I, and I've expressed many times, this concept of a town hall meeting. My own campaign committee structure, structured on the concept of working groups, working groups and focus groups and how we can essentially zone in on issues of concern, work together. We have moved away from a society that says, well, let's hash out the issues, let's hear from you. Even now, I mean, I beg that we have a town hall meeting on education, hash it out in our respective communities. My God, we're in a crisis right now when it comes to, to healthcare. I would have soon by now would have had a town hall meeting. We gotta change this and we gotta continue in every legislature as we keep on working on different elections. I would like to see more and more people rise up because part of my candidacy was also starting an organization as we move forward, centered really on pushing for better government. Thank you. So we'll go to Lionel with a caller who's called in. Thank you. We'll take that now. Thank you. Good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you for calling in. Greetings. How are you? <laughs> Me too.
Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you and blessed love. And I thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, yeah, so we tentatively have set our food sale for October 6th. Um, so we're working on the details and um, of course, you know, uh, those helping us with the cooking and things like that. So, and also as part of it too, part of joining the effort for um, I'd like to mean if you have any offer any assistance too in that regard, we also look for, for, for folks to join the campaign. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So moving on, and so what I also want to speak about, and I want to kind of break down a few things to uh, go in a little more specific into. Um, I'm going to get start back with economic development. One of the things that I find, um, and I spoke to this issue of how we don't properly utilize what we have. Uh, case in point, between several of our different entities, we have, we have assets, we have things like that. What I would like to see at a, great, a greater level on the economic development side of things is the possibility of us examining how the structure of many of our financial entities. And I would like to seek a transparency being at the center of that. This concept, we throw it around transparency, accountability. What does that look like? I'd like to take a step back to, to, to indicate the fact that the legislature, we're, we're the oversight entity, we're the first branch of government to do very, that you know, very important task of oversight. That's one over, over, over government and not just an oversight over all of government, essentially, and the power to investigate. There are many times where we've had, and, and we have a, an, ins an inspector general who conducts audits. There have been many audits of several boards. There have been many audits, and the question now becomes, how can we take those audits, and that's as the, as a, in a, within a legislative body, and use that to make amendments? Those inspector general reports that show issues with governance to show uh, issues with conflict of interest and I will highlight that one of the biggest things I see within even our economic entities is a lot of times that conflict and the public finance authority having issues of issuing contracts and things like that that's going to be really important for me and my colleagues to work together to help to restructure that and I hope that there's enough political willpower I can speak to myself but to speak to others who have that willpower to make those changes this board hospital crisis, the, the crisis that we face, we have to really address that in, in conflict of interest issues. Okay, good morning. I mean, uh, good afternoon, my colleagues. Good afternoon. We have a caller? Yeah, pleasant good afternoon. How are you? Um, excellent question. So just last night, um, part of my campaign committee, we have an education working group. So I've, and they're made up of educators, parents, grandparents. And that's even before I ran for office because in the last, um, if you remember last year, there was a town hall meeting held at Canagata. And if you remember that, and that was by board member, uh, Vice Chair Peggy um, Mary Moorhead. Uh, she's a member of the board. Um, I was also ass assisted her with that, with that planning. There was actually one also planned for the West part. We do get a lot of pushback from the Department of Education, just to let you know that, in terms of holding town hall meetings. But I would assume that um, continued effort would be, so yes, so yes, the answer is, is yes. I've already reached out to educators, and even with the context of the curriculum. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely in touch, and I'm hoping to continue that, that push. So yes, definitely reach out to several ed educators. And, yeah. Yeah. Excellent, and I don't know if you heard one of the forms I was on. I spoke specifically of, of one measure, sunset. Um, that is the ability to shut down a board and to revisit and enforce them to do their mandate. 
there's also been a me I also support like I will also sponsor legislation to amend the makeup of our boards and that and that you even saw with the GRS um, board where um, it was amendment made to that to increase the number of qualified people within economics and finance so uh, but in terms of our elected board we have a board of education that's made of elected members so that's gonna uh, that will require a look at it but I want to highlight when it comes to vocational education we're speaking about the career and technical board and those members are made up of persons appointed by the governor. And uh, we have seen now, and there's enough years to show, that many of the boards have been effective. So it's going to require, but, it's, but we can't do that just on a wholesale approach. The, the concept of sunset is that I think we're, we can sunset a number of boards already because there's a lot of inefficiencies, but we can't do that without, of course, hearing from the boards themselves. Um, so that's what the, the whole process of us addressing the issues would really require the, that a greater examination, working with the boards, uh, giving them an opportunity, and if they don't, and, and giving them a short time for that opportunity, because they've had a lot of opportunities, to be honest with you, and then working with the governor, because the governor has to also be part of this, this whole effort. He or she appoints the members to many boards. So essentially, that's my approach, would be to examine it. We have to shut them down. We will we'll need to do that. And then also changing the composition. Conflict of interest is also very big in terms of the issues with boards. Thank you. So with election reform, um, back in I think 1974, we actually had an elections commission, and that um, part of it was examining that it, those issues. So they vetted a lot of laws. We haven't had a proper um, effort to to do that. So, but just to highlight, um, uh, part of my work had, was in um, assisting with that effort. We met many times, but to, but quite frank with you, um, many uh, many suggestions were made and actual legislative proposals that were ignored by several legislatures now. So um, essentially, my commitment to that is to, in fact, being quite aware of many different election systems throughout the country, because I was also on the U.S. Elections Assistant Commission Board. Um, I would offer legislation to examine that, the possible, you know, um, looking at the composition, uh, particularly about the, the supervisor uh, position itself, in terms of, you know, people talk about it maybe being elected, and then also uh, issues surrounding um, any elections process. Okay, so thank you so much. Great, so thank you so much, and let me see we have, okay, so we're almost um, out of time. So of course you can call in, and as I offer, as I close out, to provide a closing to the department. Seven? Seven? Okay, sorry, I'm kind of a little fast. And so what I wanted to, as I was uh, right before the caller, um, the person called in, speaking to the issues of transparency and accountability, uh, highlighting the importance of enforcement. I don't I, I, we and just to highlight something not that we're going to get into a point we're going to uh, litigation is always, also always going to be the, the choice but we have some real serious issues right now with enforcement a law is passed and nobody's held accountable and that be in other words this the legislature and the majority of the body is not in, you know making any kind of step to say well this has to be enforced and what the caller pointed out was the issue with boards you can't, we can't enforce the appointment of members. But as, at this point, wouldn't it be a possibility and wouldn't it make some sense to look at the composition of boards? Possibly we'll need to start to, and there's some boards that actually allow for the legislature to do the appointments and uh, as we balance government. It's about balancing. Also, we have to work on the balances between all three branches of government. And there's levels of imbalances as well as we look at some of the issues we face. There are even, there are even the, the, and I'll go back and I'll highlight something important, and that was I touched on conflict of interest. There's been a call and concern over our attorney general, the person having been appointed by the governor, and by statute supposed to be the attorney for the people in addressing many of our concerns, especially in the consumer areas and, and, and other areas. One of the things that the attorney general is supposed to do right now as we speak 
is to address conflict of interest. So when we hear about some of the fallouts and different boards, we're talking about the hospital board and others, there are a lot of issues of conflict of interest in which people have to disclose if there are any kinds of relations and things like that. In a small community, that's really critical. So the commitment that I have to all of this is that I will hold the executive branch accountable for the laws that are passed. And for those that need to be amended to make government more effective, I'm committed to doing that as well. I'm committed to the another area of serving as a representative, and that's in, in, in programs. So we're saying now we have a crisis after school and not enough of those programs and, and, and various things. Part of the effort of my office will be, in fact, an outreach. We have environmental issues and things like that. So part of it is that I will be committed to engage in, in outreach efforts. So I can't do that alone. We cannot do that alone. And so when we think about how we want the Virgin Islands to look, let's envision, let's, let's take a step back and let's envision what do we want our community to look like? What do we want our, our St. Croix respective town areas, the whole island, the Virgin Islands, what do we want it to look like five years from now as we rebuild? as we begin to restore government, as we begin to say, well, this is how I would like it to look. I would like our, our, to see new schools built. I would like to ensure that our children receive the right education so that, that they, are, they become lifelong learners. I would like to see, in fact, that we have a robust economy we can even offer many more scholarships to our children. We, of course, now are hearing about the free tuition for college, but I would say even deeper than that, we need to get address the issue of people being college ready. Because it's one thing to offer the scholarships, but the question becomes, okay, so are they prepared to go to college? And that's another piece that we've fallen behind because, again, the Career Technical Board doesn't have enough members. The Board of Education has not followed the mandate for curriculum at the level they should. We have crisis within the morale because of teacher pay. And what I will, will end with as the shows progress and this, the issue of crime and crime prevention. I come to you also as a criminal justice advocate, knowing the fact that, and if offered the right pathway, people would not choose a life of crime, but also we have economics tied into that. I will sponsor legislation to establish a teen court program among other juvenile justice programs and working with the Department of Human Services at Overseas <laughs> Youth Rehabilitation Center to address the very issues surrounding crime, crime prevention, and the, and the like. Also tied into that is are the reentry programs for our prisoners and addressing the issues of training and vocational education, preparing them as they come out of the prison. So as we close out in the last few minutes, I want to say thank you. Thank you to, to you, Mario. Thank you to all the listeners and, and, and everyone who's um, you know, listened to me and today and offered support throughout this journey. It's been an incredible journey, and I just want to say God bless, God blessings to, you know, and God's richest blessings to each one of you. And number 21 is, and we, we say throw up the VI sign, number 21, and we say number 21 is a vote for the Virgin Islands. Thank you so much, and I will definitely return. And for those of you who want to again join the campaign committee, reach out to me. I look forward to having you. Or Troy as well, and thank you so much. We have, you wanna take the last one? Okay. Yeah, so thank you so much. <laughs>